Good morning, everybody. Uh, how you doing today? Thanks for jumping back on this. Um, yeah, <laughs> did a database episode the other day and uh, had some challenges. Had some challenges specifically with one very uh, definitive service that we're going to dive into today, Amazon DynamoDB. So before we get started, some simple logistics. We are broadcasting live on LinkedIn. We are broadcasting live on uh, Periscope or Twitter. Um, taking questions as we go, taking comments as we go. So please don't hesitate to hit me up here on um, LinkedIn, also on uh, Twitter. Uh, my camera seems to be having a real heck of a time focusing on me today. Uh, let me fix that before everybody goes crazy. Uh, let me give you something better to look at while I'm doing that. So one of the things we talked about on uh, last episode was the break, uh, sort of the, the discussion on what uh, Amazon database services there are. Now there's uh, several of them broken up. We're gonna review that while I fix the camera. Um, so the uh, Amazon database services get basically get broken up into um, a set of structures, right? So we have relational databases, that's Aurora, that's Redshift, that's RDS, um, with the database migration service to help you uh, work between them. Um, we have uh, the document DB, which is a MongoDB solution. Um, we also have uh, the graph database with this Dynam or uh, Neptune, which I really like, but I wish it was, um, I very much wish that Dyna uh, Neptune was a serverless offering. Um, there we go. Now, is that going to still focus? All right, as long as I don't move too much, I think we're okay. Um, so graph database, the database we shall not talk about, the quantum ledger one. Um, nope, still having that problem for you. Hold on, let me fix that so you don't go insane. Um, uh, Marcos, love the attitude, trying to fix it so that we can get there. Uh, time series database with time stream. Um, time stream's very, very cool, uh, but also sir, very early days for time stream, even though it's been out for a while. And we have our in-memory databases with uh, Elasticache, so Memcached Redis. Um, and then we have our uh, our key value, which is DynamoDB. Now DynamoDB is a beast. It is an absolute beast, okay? It is a workhorse. The vast majority of people uh, are going to be um, leveraging it at some point. It is an absolute uh, ground changing or groundbreaking database from AWS. Um, they've written a few papers about it. Uh, there has been a lot. There we go. Let me get me in focus now. Do, do, do. Yikes. That is way too much me. Quick. Away. Away. Right on. Um, there is a uh, way. Um, Oh my God, it's just one of those days with the camera, people. One of those days with the camera. Um, so DynamoDB, they've written a few papers on. They've had uh, some really fantastic success, obviously. It is a phenomenal service. Wow, what is going on with this camera? Um, we are gonna switch cameras. Uh, it's phenomenal service, uh, lots of great um, scale, and uh, I messed it up, let's be 100% honest. There we go, all right, I messed it up last time. When I tried to show it to show it to you, like just colossal f up. So let's fix that right now. Let us uh, share. So let's go split screen for a second. I want to go back to this. I'm gonna add in uh, my camera if I can. There we go. All right. So we talked about relational databases. Quick recap of Wednesday. Relational databases. You have a table. So in this case, I've got uh, like a name table with names in it. I've got names to buses and bus routes. This is me trying to model where buses go and who rides them. Um, so with that, uh, let's see, uh, that's a traditional sort of relational database. Um, very simple, uh, very um, straightforward design. And if you guys are in the comments on LinkedIn, please check out what Andrew just posted. <laughs> Absolutely awesome uh, Pokemon interpretation 
of Amazon Neptune. Um, so here's our relational database structure, pretty straightforward. And to query it, we have this monstrously horrible standard SQL query where we talk about selecting everything from names and we call that N. We join it with another table, names to buses, we call that N to B. We match up the IDs. We join with the buses table again and we call that B and we make sure that the bus ID lines up and that will actually give us saying, you know, Mark rode the bus here to there. Now Neptune lets you graph it out, which gives you this much more simple sort of logical structure. I think this definitely um, is, a, is how most people manage uh, or would visualize the data in their head. And then you can query it out um, with a very straightforward, now this is uh, GraphQL, but you could query it with a different uh, structure as well. Um, and uh, this is a great way to do it, but DynamoDB is far more comfortable for a lot of people, um, despite what I showed you the other day. And I made a classic, classic mistake. What I tried to do the other day on stream, and you can watch the disaster of it near the end of the last episode, was that I tried to replicate this database structure, the relational database structure in DynamoDB. Bad. 100% bad. I fell into the number one common pitfall of people trying to use new data, uh, new services in the AWS cloud was they took what they knew, uh, what they knew, and they tried to shove it in as is. Now, would it have worked? Yeah, absolutely. You could set this database structure up in DynamoDB. You are going to be paying way more money than you need to be. Um, but this would 100% work. Um, but that's not what the point is. You would have uh, a bunch of challenges at scale. It would start to slow down. Um, it would really grind to a halt because it's clunky old school thinking. Now, if you shove this database structure into Aurora, it'll work like a charm. That'll scale to, to billions of rows easily because this is a traditional database design. But that's not what Dynamo is. Dynamo is a key value store with a lot of cool stuff behind it. So what we're going to do is show you how this uh, same setup, same data would look in DynamoDB. And this would all be in one big table. So I would have multiple object types sitting in the same table. Now that is amazingly uncomfortable and um, abnormal for a lot of people. Right, is that you normally, you know, database logic, database principles 101 is that you put one data type per table. But we're not dealing with ta uh, the traditional database here, we're dealing with DynamoDB. So in this case, what you actually want to do is you want to set up multiple entities in one table because there's a whole bunch of advantages there, not to mention the fact that Dynamo won't even miss a beat when it's doing this. Um, yeah, Andrew in the LinkedIn comments, um, you guys, if you're not following Andrew Brown, uh, he's the CEO of Example, you absolutely should. Uh, fantastic guy, knows his stuff inside and out as well. Um, great community member, uh, definitely uh, follow him and follow his uh, his videos and his streams when he's doing them and check out uh, all, this, all the work that he's done for the community. Um, but great, great example, he's saying, you know, key value and document-ish store. Very true, document-ish. If you have a ton of information in each of these entities that you're seeing here, so we have a customer, a bus, and a ride. If we had a ton of information, we may want to consider actually using document DB, not Dynamo DB, but we don't have a huge amount. Now, the reason why I say huge amount is because Dynamo DB is, as Andrew said very appropriately, a flat and dumb database. It is flat and dumb. Spot on, that is, I'm totally stealing that, Andrew, and I appreciate it. Uh, it is a flat and dumb database. Uh, the beauty of it, though, is uh, it is fast as all get out. It scales ridiculously big, um, but it is limited to 400 kilobytes per entry or per entity. So if you put something into a, into a table, you can have as many attributes, as, uh, or there are limits, but you can have a ton of attributes associated to it, a bunch of data in those attributes, as long as it all totals up to 400 kilobytes or less. If you need to over 400 kilobytes, go to document DB. So in this case, what we've got is we've got a customer. Very simply right now, we're just gonna have a first name, last name. That's replacing our names table. And we're gonna create an object ID. The key for this is gonna be customer, then first, dot la or first dash, last dash, and then a number. So most of our customers are going to be 01 because they'll be unique names. Believe it or not, there is another Mark Nanakovan in the world. Um, distant cousin, uh, lives in the States. Um, so if he was also a bus rider in this, this system, he'd be 02, right? 
Um, then we have a bus entity, and this bus entity has an object ID of the bus and then the route number um, with a start location, a finish location, and then the stops, right? And you could see a schedule at some point if you wanted. Then we have a ride entity, and this ride entity is really designed to connect these two, but also to provide additional information. So first bus stop, last bus stop, the bus that you're taking, the customer that took it, um, time, things like that. And now the object ID I started with was ride with a timestamp, um, and then uh, a bus uh, number, right? So you would say ride uh, 2019 1101, you know, 08, to say someone took the bus at 8.05 in the morning, um, and then the bus and then uh, an, an index number for that. There is a better way to do that. Breaking out the timestamp as a partition key um, will help you, uh, or a sort key will help you filter those faster. Um, but for this point, uh, it's gonna be enough. So we're gonna switch over to Chrome and I am gonna show you what this looks like. So again, um, I already dropped the link uh, in LinkedIn on the comments. Um, so you can um, fire off there to see uh, the previous streams. Uh, also, I'm giving a couple talks at reInvent um, and I link out to the guide. But uh, what I wanted to show you is in the uh, Dynamo console, I've recreated some of what we're talking about here. So let me scale this out a little bit so you guys can see it better. Yeah, it's looking good. Let's get this bigger. They do need to make better stream tools to resize windows. So uh, I've created exactly what we talked about. I have an object that's a customer mark and you see here I have a first name and a last name and then the object ID. I also have uh, our buses. I've entered in two buses. So this uh, is bus number two, this is bus route two. Starts at the airport, ends at the convention center and I could add additional stops. So it stops at the apartment building in between um, these two areas so on and so forth. Now here's a ride. Now you'll notice the ride object ID is uh, ride to tell me what type of entity, then the timestamp, which I said we could break out, which might be better, um, with a bus and then uh, the bus number. Uh, so the bus ID is this, and then a ride number. So we could actually make this a little more efficient at scale by eliminating the timestamp. Um, and make that into a partition key, but we also wanna make sure that this object ID is unique. It has to be unique if we are going to index it. Um, so we wanna make sure that that's, uh, that's a uh, consideration moving forward. Now you can't change um, anything in an index. Once it's there, you have to actually duplicate the object and then change it um, and then delete the original object. A little quirk from Dynamo. Um, but I'm going to switch to another AWS tool, and it's another AWS tool that you might not actually be aware of, um, and it's called uh, the NoSQL Workbench for Amazon Dynamo DB Preview. Let's all admit, let's just take a pause and admit that AWS has a serious naming problem. Uh, Corey Quinn, good friend of mine, is uh, all over this all the time. Uh, they just really can't name squat. Now this is really going to be hard to see. I want to see if we can actually look. Uh, does this look good? This is going to be too tricky to see, I think. All right, you can almost see it. Yes. Andrew was correct, NoSQL Workbench. So what we've got here is actually a way to query it. You can see it already has our um, bus stop table, our bus system table. So if we open that up, we can see the metadata that just gives us the um, table ARN, which is super important if you're using it um, through the CLI or programmatically. Uh, but what I wanted to actually do was query something here. So uh, I bear with me because it is, I can't make this any bigger because of the way, oh, actually, I can, awesome. They are totally just making this a web thing underneath. There we go, now we can see it. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm actually going to make a query. So if I um, scan uh, this out, if I go build operations, I'm gonna query uh, what I, come on, this is the downside of a desktop app that's really just a web browser. Um, so my partition key is my object ID, what I'm looking for is a first name string that contains Mark. And if I execute that, you see it doesn't actually say anything. But if I come here and say first name equals string and then the value is Mark, 
it's actually going to pull that customer record up. I could do the same thing with Nunnikoven. Now, the interesting thing here in the background, of course, it's not that last name. That's why. Come on, there we go. Okay, so you can query by these attribute values. Now you notice we only had one customer in our um, database, which uh, you know is fine, that's fine at scale. You'd have hundreds or thousands of customers depending on how successful your bus system was. But you notice when you query, um, a lot of these objects actually don't have uh, first name, last name attributes. So what Dynamo does automatically is it just ignores those um, objects that don't have the um, attributes that you're querying. So if you're looking for first name, you are not going to get a whole bunch of null records uh, out of bus or you're not going to get any ride information. You are just going to get the customer objects. Now you could obviously filter your uh, key by the entity name, which is why it's a good practice to have your entity name in your object ID to make it simple. Um, but we could also uh, sit there and go with, um, if we go object ID, and string uh, no, bus. So if we start with, begins with bus. There we go. So if we filter the object IDs beginning with bus, we get to see all of our buses. If we do the same thing with a ride, we get to see our ride. And you can see here, this is a one table solution instead of multiple tables. And that's the key for DynamoDB is having one monster table and letting that um, take care of everything. And that's a really weird way of thinking of things. Like, trust me, that is weird. And that's the common mistake uh, that people make. I made that mistake on the stream on Wednesday, right? I fumbled around trying to get one um, solution, uh, like a traditional database solution shoved into uh, Dynamo. And what I wanna call out um, is a post from the good folks at Trek 10. Um, this is uh, Forrest uh, Brazil, a uh, good, uh, good friend of mine, he co-hosts the Serverless Conf. Um, he put this up, or at least his team did, and they quoted him. Um, this tweet really sums it up, and I, I will post this actually right now in the LinkedIn chat, because you guys should check this out. Um, blog post from Trek 10. Definitely should check this out. So this is this is from last year from reInvent. Uh, this is from uh, DAT 401, which is Advanced Design Patterns for DynamoDB. I'll, I will read this to you just in case you can't see it. So Forrest says, so for the first 45 minutes of this reInvent session, I was nodding my head like, yep, that's how I think about DynamoDB. Then Rick morphed into some kind of NoSQL wizard from outer space and my mind exploded, absolute must watch. And that is 100% correct. Uh, because this talk really walks you through, and Rick is one of the key people behind Dynamo and the other NoSQL services from AWS. Um, this talk really walks you through, okay, hey, here's how you think about data, just like I did on Wednesday. Here's why that won't work well in Dynamo, even though you can kind of punch it into place. Uh, here's how you can start to morph and adjust these things to really take off. And you're right, Marcos, this is absolute, this post is, is pure gold. Um, and there's a couple others. So the pattern that we used today in our, um, uh, it's not the post I want. Uh, where is it here? Uh, many, many relationships. So the post that we, or the, um, one of the uh, patterns we use to get the many to many relationships, which is many riders, uh, or a rider can have many, um, rides and uh, or a bus can have many riders and riders can be on many buses and um, we use this new this pattern called the adjacency list um uh, i was posting this there we go there's another key doc so this is a really interesting way of breaking down your primary keys and if i can recommend anything when it comes to dynamo db and i know i don't have too many legs to stand on because of wednesday's debacle but hopefully we've redeemed ourselves a little bit showing how we can build it out as one table now um is that uh you really need to think about your primary key sort so the example they use here and unfortunately the aws docs are not really written with human interaction in mind, um, very much engineer to engineer, which is great if you're in that mindset, which is uh, why I pulled up the Trek 10 post. Um, I think the Trek 10 post is far better um, in its uh, in its language. 
uh, and I'm just posting another link here. Uh, there you go. There's the AWS local query tool. Um, so here they're talking about this schema of how they set up Dynamo with the idea of invoices and bills and many invoices and an invoice can have many bills. So they've got a partition key. In this case, it's an invoice and then an ID and the sort key and the global secondary info, uh, index, the GSI, the global secondary in index. They've got, uh, in this case, an invoice ID, but then they've got bill IDs underneath it as well. So they're using a partition key and a sort key together to figure out what this specific entry is. Now that helps them create these different relationships because the bills can stand on their own. The bills can reference out to the invoices. The invoices can reference the bills. But the important thing is you do this all in one table. And that is a, um, a key structure that happens again and again is that almost every single database design when it comes to DynamoDB should be in one table, just one. If you're doing multiple tables, you're doing it wrong. That's why I'm doing this stream today is to make up for me doing it wrong on Wednesday. And again, wrong in the standard way of adopting AWS services. When you first start, it's going to work. You're going to forklift traditional views and values over. Um, it may work uh, for a little while, but at some point it will die a horrible fiery death. Um, there will be just nonstop dumpster fires that you have to clean up. So Andrew has also brought up another good comment here in the LinkedIn uh, feed um, is that a huge pain in Dynamo is choosing the string format for your date times. 100% man, 100%. So there's two ways to tackle this um, and, and well, there's multiple ways to tackle it, but the best way to do is to step back for a second and actually um, the team at Trek 10 call this out in their post um, because it's also based on AWS's advice. Um, is step one, define the access patterns you think you will need. This advice will save you so, so much time and pain. Um, is that if you think about how you want to get data out, we talked about that on Wednesday across all the database services. If you look at how you're going to pull data out of Dynamo, that's going to help you figure out how you're going to set up your keys, um, but also how you're going to set up your uh, timestamps. So common breakaways, so timestamps should always be, and I for, apologize, you know what, I don't even apologize. I was going to apologize to my American friends, but no, this is just flat out wrong. Americans do this wrong. Dates need to be sequential. So whether you do year, month, day, or day, month, year, orders of magnitude, man, um, not month, day, year. That makes no sense. So if you're creating a date key, the real question I have, um, so keep it sequential. Um, I normally go year, month, day, because that's a logical way of drilling down on stuff. So if I was looking uh, back to our um, bus example here, when we look at the ride key, we've got year, month, then day, then hour, then minute. Um, this makes it easy to do those begin with queries. So if I want to begin at all rides that were in November, I begin with 2019-11, right? If I want to know everything that happened um, today, 2019-11-01. So it lets you query down that way. The biggest question uh, a lot of people have, and it depends on you, the scale of your data and the way you're tackling it, is whether that timestamp includes more uh, than just um, more than just the time the date or if you need to um, add the time in there as well. And that really depends on your data and your access patterns. If you don't need the timestamp, then you can remove it. Um, but also general, just sort of, uh, you know, too many years doing this experience thing. It's always easier to use granular data in a less granular way than it is to try to add granularity later. So if you know the time something happened, add it in. Like just add it in. Uh, you're not paying like 400k uh, record. Adding a couple additional bytes to track the time in a timestamp is not um, the end of the world. So I strongly recommend going year, month, day, hour, minute, second if you have it, um, because then you can filter those with the begins with right, um, which I find really, really useful. Um, and you can also do ends with to calculate based on time. So that's another nice thing is if you have timestamp as its own um, deal, you can start by saying, uh, you know, begins with, I'm putting this in the comments, year, 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 month, month, day, day. You can also do ends with um, hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second. 
So you could say, you know what? Tell me everything that happened at eight, in, in the eight o'clock hour in the morning. So if you're looking at our bus system example, that might be really thin, prime time. You could say, I want to know everything that happened in eight, eight at eight a.m. Um, regardless of the day, because I want to see how prime time ebbs and flows for that hour in my city, right? So you can do that with the key because you've already got it set up. But if that key um, is in your index, which it should be, uh, and indexing Dynamo is a whole other thing. Um, indexes speed up those queries. Uh, then you're all set, right? So you can manipulate that timestamp um, using those begins and ends if you have year, month, day, hour, second. Uh, now, that's why I said also in the intro when we were looking at our data model, and let me just flip back to that, when we were looking at our general data model, um, that that timestamp in the ride ID might be more useful uh, pulled out as its own key, as a sub key, right, as a sort key. So that might be far more useful because then we can do those manipulations. But you can see just even us talking this through, there's a ton of um, things that you really need to kind of look at to make sure that you've got your data model set correctly. Now, the good news is if you mess this up, um, and again, follow through the Trek 10 post here, um, you know, talking about the, the partition key and the sort key and how to set this up, um, key, keeping the item um, right in, in the one table is absolutely critical. Um, but what I'm getting at here is that the, you know, even if you make a mistake in your initial data design, the beauty of Dynamo is that it can be so fast um, that you can compensate for some poor design decisions, but you can also always just move everything from one table to another. It's easy enough to go through them uh, and set them up. And I'm relatively certain that there are actually some um, tools in uh, Dynamo uh, to help make that simpler to kind of cut things over if you did completely mess things up and you need to break up a key into its own individual field. So um, lots to think about with Dynamo, uh, but the key takeaway and the reason why I wanted to redo this part of the stream and spend more time on it is that uh, Dynamo scales like wildfire, right? It is a fantastically, uh, as Andrew Brown put it here on LinkedIn, uh, it's dumb and flat, uh, but it's fast as all get out, right? Uh, very low cost overall as well, especially now that auto scaling is in place. Dynamo um, prices based on number of reads and writes allocated, whether you use them or not. So auto scaling lets you go up and down in a far more sensible way now. Um, but it's also very, it's serverless. Um, it's uh, pure cloud native, but you need to design cloud native way. On Wednesday, I made the very common mistake of taking what I knew and was familiar with and then just dumped it into Dynamo. And would that work? Absolutely. Would it um, be inefficient? Yeah, 100%. But Dynamo is strong enough to overcome that efficiency, which actually can be a problem because I could have gotten away with that design for quite a while when it's not the right design. Um, flipping it over and putting everything into one table um, is the way to go. One table, it rules the world for Dynamo. So definitely uh, read the Trek 10 post, um, check out the uh, Dynamo uh, talk from reInvent. That is the way to go. Um, re, you know, Spend 50 minutes watching that from Rick, it's phenomenal. Um, Augusto just put a good comment in the LinkedIn uh, a question, uh, but sharing these links, absolutely. One of the things I do after each of these streams, so they went live on LinkedIn, we went live on Periscope. Um, I post these to my YouTube channel, but also to um, my uh, website. Um, and as part of that, uh, in my website, I will actually put the extra links I call out and any slides that I use. Um, uh, so I'll put that link there again. You'll see that that'll be up in probably half an hour or so. I run it through a transcription and we're all good off to the races. So I uh, appreciate you guys spending the time with me today. I'm sorry about the camera foobar a little bit earlier. I was messing around with some settings, trying to get ready for some other streaming that I'm doing next week. Um, so I continue to do this stream, Road to reInvent, leading up to reInvent. Um, but uh, next week, I am actually starting a new series um, with Trend Micro. I'm going to be doing a uh, Cloud Talk, Let's, let's, let's Talk Cloud um, with Trend Micro, bringing in various guests. Uh, first one kicks off Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, look on the Trend micro channels for more about that um, but for this one like I said come back and check out uh, the website that I just put up so markn.ca you'll see it's the main link there and I will put all the stuff we've talked about thank you for letting me, re me redeem myself after an absolute cluster you know what on Wednesday at the end of the stream this the rest of that streams great by the way we talk about the pros and cons of each database service but when I started fumbling around in Dynamo I Felt really bad because it was horrible and you guys deserve better. So this was the redemption. Um, thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys are set up for a phenomenal weekend and uh, let's keep the conversation going. We'll talk to you soon.